Hello. Welcome. Welcome. So in the previous episode, we have been working on this processor and we got conditional logic working. So we can have conditional branches and we changed a few things. We now have this control circuit here and this is controlling several different parts of the processor now. And as part of that, I thought I would add some test cases. So I did add a test case for the conditional logic here. So it's just using conditional branches and the E construction, and it's just a modified form of the jump test. So it's just going through and doing the same kind of maze, but making sure that it falls through at least a couple of times. I think I check if the BRT falls through and somewhere else I check if BRF falls through, I think. Maybe not. Um, I can change that. But anyway, uh, and running this test, it does pass. So no problems. And so conditional jumps or conditional branches are one of two things that are required in order to be Turing complete. The other thing that's required is access to an arbitrary amount of memory. And arbitrary is kind of like the amount of memory that you require in order to do the task that you want. An actual Turing machine has an infinite amount of memory, but we don't need an infinite amount of memory in most cases. So usually Turing complete is not defined as infinite, just enough, essentially. And right now, the only place that we can remember things is in these four registers here. And that's, for most tasks, not enough. You probably need quite a bit more memory than that. For example, there's no way to store and read in an image or, you know, even a string using just four registers. So you can't even display text, which is pretty limited. So I think in this episode, I'd like to move us a little bit closer towards having memory that we can read and write to. Now, there's two different ways of doing that. They're called memory architectures. And one is the von Neumann memory architecture. And that's probably the one that you're used to in any given general purpose computer. So uh, von Neumann means that you can read and write any part of memory, including the program memory. So there's only one memory, only one address space, and you have access to all of that. Now, the other way of doing it is called the Harvard architecture. Harvard architecture means that you have a program store and you have a separate piece of memory for your data store. So I've decided to do a Harvard architecture in this computer. And the main reason for that is simplicity. I want to keep the control logic as simple as possible. Uh, one issue with von Neumann architecture is that you can't fetch the next value from memory for the program at the same time as reading or writing a data value that the program wants to read or write. So then you end up needing to span the operation over two clock cycles. And currently this processor executes everything in a single clock cycle. So it fetches a value from memory, which is the instruction. It decodes and interprets that instruction, executes it, and writes the value back to the register file all in a single clock cycle. Now, that's not the most efficient way of doing things because your propagation delay is very long. It's as long as the entire processor. And as you can see, the processor keeps getting wider. But it's also quite simple. And while it might not be very fast, there's no major state machines in here. There's a bit of one with the T-bit in that the T-bit has to affect the next instruction and there'll be a bit more. And I might want to split this into a state machine eventually where the fetch, decode, and execute are in separate clock cycles. But for now, I think it's prudent to get everything working in the simplest way possible. And so let's continue with that and let's choose the Harvard architecture, even though von Neumann would be a little bit better in some ways, uh, just for simplicity, so that we've got the simplest possible thing that could work. So given that, we have some memory that we could use. 
And there's a bunch of different kinds of memory in here. For this, I'm just going to use block RAM because that's what's going to be available on an FPGA. So we've got some memory and we need some logic to access that memory. And I think a module for memory access would be very handy. And I think we go probably between the execute unit and the register file. But these halt and error signals are kind of in the way, so let's just move them out of the way. So let's call this the mem access module. So we need a few inputs and outputs. The outputs will mainly drive the inputs of this. So we need an address, which will be 16 bits. We need a D in, we need store. And we won't worry about the clock, we'll pass that in separately. And then on the input side, we have an input for data out or D. We also need to take the result from the ALU because that's where we'll calculate our address. But then we want to pass that through if we're not actually doing a memory access. So, um, uh, and this will be the right value, I guess, for lack of a better term for it. Um, Maybe we'll come up with a better name later. We also need some opcode stuff. So we need to know if this is a memory access or not. And we need to know uh, which kind of memory access it is. So let's call it a memop. Okay, I think this is good enough for a bit of a start. So our memory op, the lower bit will indicate whether we're doing a load or a store. In this case, I'm going to ignore the upper bit. So this is two bits. The upper bit tells you whether it's a word store or a byte store, uh, or load for that matter as well. Uh, for now, we're going to not worry about byte access. We're just going to worry about reading and writing words and we'll handle byte access later. So we've got whether or not it's a memory operation as the upper bit here into this multiplexer, and then we've got whether it's a load or a store into the lower bit. So in the case of no memory operation, we always wanna pass the result directly through and write that out. Now, if we are storing, we wanna take the data that we loaded from memory, we want to write that into the register. If we're loading, or no, if we're loading, that's what we want to do. So we want to put this on that pin. Now, if we're writing, then we don't want to change the register at all. So we want this to go the, hmm. We need another input pin, actually. We need uh, rdval because results will be our address. We don't want to write our address into the register. We want to write the original value. So we need rdval for that. Now we have address, which the address is going to come in on the result line. And we have whether or not we're storing, which whether or not we're storing is the end of these two values. And then dn is what value we're writing. So if we're writing, we're writing what was in the rd register. So I believe this is it. So let's try and put this into the circuit. Here we go. Um, I don't think it needs to be that wide. 
There we go. How about that? Maybe stick it right here. And move everything over again. All right, I guess we need to add the pins into the control unit in order to control the memory access. All right, well, let's get the control lines going. Um, we're going to have to figure out the address in just a bit, but let's get what we started here working. So in the opcode space, we're looking right here, which means the opcodes start with 000, and of course the system bit is zero. So we want to match that. So we want to make sure that we're sending a zero for the memory op if mem is zero because we don't want to accidentally write to memory if we're using whatever computed result as an address. So this just makes sure that everything is nice and safe. So we take the least significant two bits and we send those through as the mem op and we take the top three bits and we just make sure that they're all zeros. And we also check the sys bit and make sure that that's zero because the load store instructions overlap the sys instructions. So I think this should work. There is an extra complication though, and that is with the address. We're using the result as the address here. And in order to do that, we need the execute unit to calculate the address using the right hand value and the immediate. And we want to ignore the left hand value. Or do we? Hmm. Well, we want the immediate to be on the left, I think. Yeah, because we're directly accessing RD val. Yeah, I think that's what we want. Um, and another thing that we do want is we want it to add. So we want to add these two together, and that only happens if the opcode is zero. But we change the opcode to be seven, which is what we've decided is our current no op. So that's not quite what we want. What we want is if it's a memory operation, we want to emit a zero. So the easiest way to do that actually is just to extend this to two bits and handle all of the different permutations of that. So if it's a memory operation, we always emit a zero regardless of the value of this. I mean, this is always going to be zero, so I don't know. If if mem op is high, this would be zero. So, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, but for now, this this will work fine. We can always optimize things later if we find that this is producing too much logic. Okay, so now we need this recorded somewhere.
Okay. So what we want is L to always have RDVal unless it's a memory operation, in which case we want op3, which is the raw M5, before it gets sign extended. We want to zero extend it and then send that out on L so that L will contain that value instead. Now, big question is, how, where do we get this signal? We could just get it from the instruction directly because one of the bits happens to only be set in the case that it is a memory operation. So if we look in here, we, we can see that bit two is only set in this case. Every other case is zero. So we could just grab that, or we could grab the mem signal from the execute unit. Um, part of the issue with getting it from the execute unit is, or not the execute unit, from, from right here is then we have to pipe it all the way back to here. And the decoder already has that information. So yeah, do we want to do this? Hmm. There's something to be said about only having a single signal for an operation. Hmm. Okay, we'll just do it this way. I already have the wire in place anyway. Okay. I guess we could try it out. So if sys, yeah, so we're getting that and the ALU function is zero. Good. Okay, that looks like it's working. Hmm. Okay, that's what I was expecting. All right, um, we need a program to actually test this out. Uh, well, first things first, we need to actually specify the load and store instructions in our CPU dev. So let me do that. So I think this makes sense. So we've got a load and a store instruction and I was going to abbreviate it, but eh, why, why? <laughs> we have six characters that we can deal with and then these fit. So we have our destination register, which we are going to load with the value at this address. And the square bra brackets are just meaning load the value pointed to by this. And the comma here is just to indicate that it's adding. This is a common syntax that I've seen. It's not the most common syntax. I've seen a more common syntax with uh, parentheses, but I kind of like this and it works. So I'm just going to use it. So we've got our address here. And then for the store, what we're doing is we're taking the value in RD and we're storing it in the address. So I swap these around. Um, it makes sense to me that the destination is always on the left, uh, even for store instructions. So that's why I have this swapped around. 
even though internally the registers are not swapped around, but that's okay. And yeah, I mean, they just have a different suffix on them. Okay, let's modify the Fibonacci code. So what we could do is just keep an address so we could move our zero, zero. And then we could store, oh, and then increment our zero. So then we're gonna store the first Fibonacci number at R zero, which begins at zero. So at the beginning of memory, and then at the next location, we're gonna store the next Fibonacci sequence number, and then, oh, wanna add one to R zero each time. There we go. Uh, I think this should work, and it should store the Fibonacci sequence in memory, or at least until the number eight anyway. Uh, but actually, we could remove this, and it'll keep going. Um, let's do that. I think. All right, we successfully made the program. Let's see if it works. Here's our memory operation. What's it storing? At address zero, it's storing one, as it should be. We're writing one back to the register. Then we add one to R zero, which we do. I think that worked. Here's our next store. We're storing, hmm, R zero, it says, is zero. That's not correct. Should be pulling RS. RS is register one. No, RS is zero, right? And then RS val is one. One should be going out on right, but it is not. A zero is going out on R. Hmm, let us investigate that. R, hmm. RS is valid. Hmm. Oh, but it's not a two reg. What? It should be a two reg. Two reg is low when it shouldn't be. Hmm. Ah. There we go. Now does it work? Here's our, okay, so, but it won't be this one, it'll be the next one, this one. This one, R should be one, which it is, it's now one, excellent. So what should end up happening is memory should be filling with Fibonacci numbers. There is indeed very Fibonacci looking numbers in here. So that's great, okay. So I guess the next issue is this doesn't display properly. I'm not showing the store. There we go. Sweet. Awesome. So we don't really know if the load works. I suppose we could try that as well. Um, so we can just make sure that it's gonna pull the same value out. Um, and actually we could save an instruction by doing this. And this would load the previous value into R3 just to make sure that it's working. Oh, and then we need to do two there. Okay, let's try that. Hmm, don't think that's correct. Nope. Hmm, why is that not correct? The address should be four. What's that address for? Five, so it should load five. And it's loading zero. Hmm, now it's loading five. Yeah, it only updates its output on a rising edge, 
And this is the way that block RAM in an FPGA behaves. Hmm. Is there a RAM that doesn't behave this way? Um, don't think so. I know the EEPROM doesn't behave that way. Hmm. Well, there's a RAM with just like here. How is that? We could try this. Hmm. And sure is a right port. Let's try this. It's loading one. It's a good sign. It's loading two. It's a good sign. Yep. Yep. It's loading the previous value, which is what we were expecting. So that's good to know that block RAM will not work. We need to load on the next cycle, which means in order to use block RAM, we would need some sort of state machine that we need to develop so that we have multiple, multiple cycles to execute the load. But for now, we can just use this RAM and kind of cheat a little bit. I don't know if this would work in an actual FPGA. It says it's exportable to VHDL though, so, and Verilog for that matter. Oh, but yeah, it says exportable to VHDL and Verilog, so I'm not sure how. This might end up being distributed RAM, maybe? I don't know, but. Yeah, nice. Okay, awesome. Well. In celebration, let's fill up all of memory with Fibonacci numbers. Awesome. We can see the Fibonacci numbers coming in. Sweet. Well, this marks the processor becoming Turing complete. Yay. Woohoo. So we have a Turing complete processor that is now filling memory with the computation that it did. We have conditional branches and we have enough memory to do this particular computation anyway. So yeah, I think this is a pretty important milestone. So awesome. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Bye.